get some more people in here. Good afternoon, everybody. I told I needed to start on time, so Nicole, you can go tell them that I did. <laughs> uh, let's get going. So first thing, I need to do some housekeeping. First, um, thank you for attending the, our first annual uh, transportation uh, summit. Uh, so far, it's been, it's been good, good information. You guys got a top back, yes, yeah, nine, yeah. 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 Woo That's better. So just some housekeeping. Um, you know we have an app if you had not uh, downloaded it already, um, just so you can participate. Uh, you need to go to Compass, uh, Crowd Compass uh, TV Hub. And when you go, you actually look for the Transportation Summit download under the events. And that'll give you an opportunity to actually know where we are in the agenda and actually to engage um, uh, with speakers and be interactive as we uh, go through the rest of the conference. We also would encourage you to hashtag if you do social media. Uh, and the hashtag is actual number sign um, NC Transportation Summit. Everybody got that? I didn't see you writing it down. You writing it down, everybody? You guys got to give me more love than that. Everybody writing it down? Yeah. There you go. Okay, it's going to be a long afternoon. Uh, and I think that's all the housekeeping I got. So I'm excited to actually be um, the moderator for this session. Uh, this session is about one of the most innovative uh, and visionary type um, um, transportation projects going on in the world, not just in this country. I'm definitely one of the top companies in this country thinking about how we move ourselves in the future. Um, this company is essentially eliminating barriers of time and distance in moving people uh, eventually, uh, goods and services while being safe. The name of the company is Version Hyperloop One. I actually had the experience about a year ago now, and I think about it, to go out and actually experience it at their headquarters, and then um, eventually going to see the actual um, prototype that they're putting together in Nevada. Uh, and I'm sure our speaker's gonna tell you more about that. Uh, today we're doing, uh, all the way from Southern California, we have Ryan Kelly, he's the head of marketing, Marketing and Communications for Virgin Hyperloop One. So uh, I'm sure he has a, a great amount of information to share. Uh, we'll have opportunities at the end of his presentation to take a few questions uh, from you all, and I'll have a few as well. So with that, uh, Ryan, I welcome you to the podium. Help me welcome Ryan to the podium. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, all right, that's good. That's up, that's good, yeah. Okay. All right, we're getting there. Um, thank you so much uh, for having me today, Chief Howard. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm gonna give some shout outs later to a couple folks in the front row, um, but thank you all uh, for having me here today. Um, I wanna do a little bit of an intro, and this is a small enough group that it's kinda like, you know, I'll tell you a little bit more about me. Um, so again, my name is Ryan Kelly. I'm the head of marketing and communications globally for Virgin Hyperloop One. And in 2016, I sold my uh, ad agency, left New York City, and moved to Los Angeles. Um, needless to say that my friends and family thought I had completely lost my mind. Um, successful ad agency and not much of a risk taker, um, but I was representing Lufthansa Airlines at the time and uh, in one of the speeches I heard about Hyperloop. And I've been lucky enough uh, in my career to ride the digital wave and the digital revolution wave. And what that's done for people has been really exciting. It's expanded opportunities, and it's brought people closer together. And when I heard about Hyperloop and what it was trying to do, um, Hyperloop for me is the equivalent of broadband. So broadband basically was the backbone of the digital revolution. I'm taking a bet, um, and hopefully at the end of this session, you understand why I took that bet that Hyperloop will be the broadband um, for smart mobility and transportation. Because guys, we need it. Um, there hasn't been a new form of mass public transportation in over 100 years. And uh, I know you all know what this is, uh, first in flight crew. Um, but this happened in 1903. And there have been innovations um, in digital that have actually allowed and, and customer preferences, to be quite honest, that have allowed for more on-demand mobility opportunities in the mass transportation space, think Bird, Lime, et cetera. But as far as new technology goes, there's been absolutely nothing. 
So uh, we'll talk a little bit about regulatory and how we've been categorized a little bit uh, later in the Q&A, but Hyperloop has been recognized um, by the U.S. government as the first new form of transportation under the FRA in over 100 years. So uh, pretty exciting stuff. And it's hard. Um, a lot of in the story that I just told you about taking that risk, um, the 250 plus employees that have taken that risk with me, the stories are very similar. And we all know what we're signing up for. We're signing up for not only creating new technology, which we'll go through today, but also how do you actually get this up and running? Because there's a huge difference between a Kitty Hawk moment and actually commercializing a system where passengers and cargo will ride. So um, we're very practical in that regard. Our CEO, uh, Jay Walder, actually ran the MTA um, in New York for years, uh, MTA in Shanghai, and actually was the CEO before this of Motivate, um, which was uh, the bike sharing program that you might have seen in New York City Bike, etc. that just actually got acquired by Lyft. Um, we have Virgin uh, on, on our door, a brand that's associated with mass transportation systems, planes, trains, etc. So everyone has come together and they believe and they know that there's such a huge demand um, and that transportation can not only um, get people there faster but expand those opportunities. So we really do envision, although it seems very far away um, from us now, uh, sitting in this room, but Hopefully you remember when you were here and maybe something like this will happen hopefully in North Carolina, but um, what actually happens um, when it comes to careers, jobs, etc., and infrastructure when you can uh, connect Charlotte to Raleigh in 22 minutes, which is what the estimate would be if we had a hyperloop system between those two cities. Where would you live? Where would you work? How many people would want to live in this area? Uh, and, and leave uh, dirty New York to come down here and live in uh, Raleigh or Charlotte, so, uh, or, or Los Angeles for that matter, which is a, it's a whole nother mess um, that we can talk about later. Um, but I want to give you first a 101 to level set for everybody in the room. Imagine traveling nonstop at up to 670 miles per hour, above land or underground. This is Hyperloop, a new mode of transportation that has been developed by Hyperloop One. It starts with an electric motor, which is broken up into two basic components, the rotor, which rotates, and the stator, which is stationary. The stator is an electromagnet, so when an electric current passes through it, the rotor is magnetically attracted to spin. Unlike a normal electric motor, the Hyperloop 1 motor isn't circular, it's linear. And the rotor is on the pod, which is propelled magnetically as it moves over the stator. Hyperloop One's unique technology uses magnetic levitation to guide and lift the pod off the track. Nearly all of the air inside the Hyperloop tube is removed using a series of vacuum pumps. This effectively creates our own sky inside the tube as if you are quietly flying at 200,000 feet above sea level. This reduces drag so only the smallest amount of electricity is needed to achieve extraordinary speeds and creates a more cost and energy efficient system than high speed rail or airline transport. Hyperloop One will be automated by the most advanced systems in the world, allowing a safe and efficient journey that's never delayed or overbooked. Hyperloop is the first new form of public transportation in over 100 years. Fundamentally, it will change the way we travel, work, and live. Welcome to the future. Welcome to Hyperloop One. Okay, so just as a recap, because there will be a quiz at the end, so we'll pass that up later, but um, for all you non-engineering folks, uh, just a little, take a step back. So a Hyperloop system, it starts with a pod. That pod can either carry uh, passengers or cargo. Uh, what makes this different than uh, high-speed rail, et cetera, is that we actually envision our pods to be much smaller um, to create a more customized experience, but those pods will actually leave within seconds of each other through our autonomous system, and we'll talk a little a bit about that. Uh, later, but carrying about 25 to 40 people uh, per pod. Once that pod is placed in a tube, we actually take out all the atmospheric pressure using vacuum systems, which would be the equivalent of being 
uh, about 200,000 feet above sea level. This is a really important part of our system. It does two things. One, um, with our IP um, magnetic levitation propulsion system that we've created, which is a, a better type of maglev. Um, we don't have maglev trains or high speed rail in the United States, but um, imagine something like a bullet train and going that fast. We can go two to three times the speed of high speed rail, and um, that means about 670 miles per hour. So as fast as a plane. Um, woo, I heard a little woo in there, okay, I like that. Uh, you guys are live out there, good. Um, so 670 miles per hour, um, and, that's, and that seems a, a little bit scary, and we'll talk a little bit about why it's not uh, as scary as you might think. Um, we all uh, fly in planes, uh, so, and we've kind of gotten over that, but actually um, being in this closed environment, uh, unlike a plane, you won't have turbulence because we are a closed system. So actually when you take off using our propulsion system, you will lightly glide um, and actually be levitating, um, which is also something kind of a little bit mind-blowing. That also allows us to bend and turn in turns in ways that high-speed rail and maglev trains cannot, um, which helps us with imminent domain issues, which we'll talk a little bit about when it comes to actually getting this implemented and up and running. Um, the lack of friction also allows us to use less energy than high-speed rail. So um, we can go two to three times as fast and use the same amount of energy or less energy. So from a cost efficiency standpoint, you know, when we're talking about ROI based on in investing in this type of technology and what you get back, um, our linear infrastructure costs and our operation costs are much, much lower than, than high-speed rail uh, and maglev. The other thing that's really important, and I mentioned the digital revolution before, um, and how important that is. Maglev technology is about 30 plus years old. So when we're thinking about creating a system for the future and future proofing it, some of that learnings from the digital revolution have to be part of this system. And so the autonomous part of our system is very, very important. Um, it's you know, part of our IP and it's, it's part of our backbone to actually run uh, the system itself. So we have a, a nice mix of hardware engineers, but we also have folks that are working in, in software as well. So everyone always, there's always a, a little bit of a gasp when we talk about the speed, and uh, we definitely do have the need for speed here, but actually people are really surprised when we talk about what our actual value proposition is with our technology. And uh, for us, it's about fast, effortless journeys that expand opportunities, because that's what mobility does. Um, every revolution that's taken place, every socioeconomic revolution that, that's taken place, um, has invested in infrastructure. And we're really trying to get back to that. Um, there's, I think there's a sense, and, and I know that our CEO feels this way, that investing in infrastructure is like treading water. Um, and in, in some ways, we have to make sure that we maintain the infrastructure that we have, but we're looking for a giant leap here. Um, and that giant leap is giving people back time. And that's not only about creating a fast product that can throw you through a tube. Um, it's also about understanding what infrastructure is on the other side. Um, and we really like to use this opportunity while we're all talking about new, new infrastructure and new type of uh, transportation, if it works, to raise the bar with other forms of and modes of transportation. So um, funny enough, I actually talk a lot at um, uh, future transport uh, opportunities with uh, airlines, um, with uh, Metro Rail, uh, Amtrak has sat in on a lot of our, our meetings as well. So they all see this as an opportunity to create a new mindset about how people think about how they travel. Why has mass transportation become, uh, you know, uh, not the first thing that people talk about or p people are comfortable taking, like the bus and the rail, um, and you know, why do we all have to be in our cars all the time? So with that being said, um, I want to talk a little bit about time savings. So part of what we're doing with the digital system we were talking about here is creating direct at, to destination and on-demand opportunities. So we want pods, those smaller pods, leaving within seconds of one another versus having something like a train schedule that would leave every half hour, an hour. Um, the reason for this flexibility and, and why it's very important, and I'm not saying that if we actually you know, were implementing this between Raleigh and Charlotte as an example, we would need that many pods leaving um, within seconds, but it actually gives us a, a great opportunity to adjust the supply and demand 
um, which Rail can't really do right now in a way that's that's programmed. So uh, from an operational standpoint, that creates a lot of uh, efficiency for us. Um, we also are going to be going airline speeds, but we want it to be an experience that's better uh, than, than the Metro. So from a safety and security standpoint, we're starting from a, a clean slate. So we can actually walk through and use new technology that things like Uber uh, have revolutionized where you can use your application and say, I need to get from Raleigh to Charlotte. Um, and potentially back out with other partners to say, you're going to get in your Uber, you're going to get to the Hyperloop station, this is when you're taking off in the next two minutes, you're going to get there and then, you know, potentially and hopefully we have partnerships with other modes of transportation where they can say, here are the mass transit opportunities if you don't have your car with you when you get to the center of the next city that you're going to. This saves a lot of, of time and energy, so when we, we think about calculating how much time it's going to take from point to point. We're also taking into account, um, you know, first and last mile as well. Um, I don't know if any of you have had the pleasure of uh, flying out of uh, LAX as of late, but um, you get to the airport and you are literally in an Uber for about 20 to 30 minutes and you are, you can see your like gate. Um, it's crazy and it's because we're retrofitting all this kind of stuff together. So um, we have a, a great opportunity here to, to uh, make some changes. Also wanna talk a little bit about sustainability. I think this is really important. I think that there's been, and I think it's changing, and even in the last two plus years that we've been talking about sustainability, I think people, the mindset is changing where this is a, a loss leader for a lot of different companies um, to say, well, if we're gonna make it more sustainable, that that obviously needs to, that's going to cost more money and it's going to affect our bottom line. And again, since we're starting from a clean slate um, and our system is 100% electric and that electricity cost is very important um, when it comes to operations and maintenance when we're talking to uh, people like Chief Howard and other investors, um, we need to be as sustainable as possible, but we also need to be thinking about the future. Um, when you're looking at uh, investment funds where part of their portfolio has to be sustainable infrastructure, there's no sustainable, there's no transportation system right now, mass transportation system, that actually, um, in Europe as an example, meets the Paris Accords. So we would be the first transportation system that would be able to do that, and we're also more cost effective and efficient than Maglo and High Speed Rail. So um, definitely a, a huge part of our value proposition here. Um, that we have zero direct emissions, but I'm not going to marketing and PR you to death and I'm going to say that just because we're electric doesn't mean that we're clean. Um, so there has to be work done in the sphere depending on where that uh, electricity is coming from, but we actually think that we have an opportunity um, to uh, create some renewable energy as well. So our footprint is much lower than maglev or high-speed rail and we can actually potentially put solar panels on our tubes, that wouldn't take care of all the energy concerns, um, but we could also put, you know, use wind technology, et cetera, to, to uh, you know, help with, with some of those uh, costs. So the other thing that's really interesting, and not to get into the weeds too much here, do we have any energy people in the room? Any chance, no? Okay. Um, darn. Okay, so, uh, and they would be really excited. They would have done that. <gasps> Uh, at this part, but um, there's there's an issue right now with clean energy um, and being able to sustain and create a sustainable future for electric cars. So if you took um, all the people that have Teslas on reserve in Santa Monica and you just plop them down there, the grid wouldn't be able to handle it. We'd have huge brownouts, and so we're really not prepared from a grid perspective. Um, to take this on. I don't know what it looks like in North Carolina. I'm not trying to create a panic. Um, yeah, it's, yeah. so it's, it's a problem that everyone is trying to solve right now. And with a Hyperloop system, because our pods actually run on electric charge, we can go faster or slower and either take in or push out energy back to the grid, which means that we would be able to actually help transfer that energy if there was a brownout or something like that and save that energy if there's not enough. Um, and then take that energy so that there's not a spike either. So that's a little bit nuanced, but for anyone that's, that's interested in something like that, um, yeah, uh, it's, it's a really interesting issue that I think will be very, very important in the next five plus years. Oh. Something we were just 
right. Okay, great. I think we're good. Um, and the other thing that's really important, and this is more policy wonky kind of stuff, but I think we have a lot of transport transportation people in the room, obviously, yes, everybody. Whew. Okay, good. I'm in the right place. Um, but uh, when we're talking about actually implementing this from a commercial standpoint, Eminent domain is very, very important in efficient land use. So when we're looking at um, the California High Speed Rail Project, a lot of the funding has been spent on figuring out how to acquire the land. Um, and so what we're trying to do is not boil the ocean. We don't need to be, Hyperloops don't need to be everywhere in the first 10 years. Um, so we're looking at very specific projects where we can use public land and use uh, land that's already in that sector. So think. Um, railway eminent domain, think highway eminent domain, and I'm actually going to show you an example of, of a feasibility study that we're doing in Missouri that actually uses I-70, um, that the Hyperloop system can actually fit um, within the median uh, uh, of that, which have never been done before. And one of the reasons why we're so efficient um, is because we're in a closed system. And so uh, because we're in the tube, we don't have the same kind of noise pollution, so we've been we can be closer to urban areas, we can go above or below ground, and our footprint with the tube is much smaller um, because we're taking out all the friction. So when you create a tube underground, so let's say that we wanted to drill underground for a maglev train, we would need to uh, create a larger tube um, so that there's no air pressure uh, issues there, but because we're getting rid of all the air pressure, we can make those tubes a little bit smaller, which from a cost efficiency standpoint um, has it in size, um, and that's a huge, cost. Um, and for those of you that might have been familiar with the Elon White Paper in 2013, um, a lot of what that talked about with Hyperloop is very different than where we are right now. Um, so he talked a lot about drilling underground. And while we think that um, to go into urban centers, that will be very important, actually a majority of our system will be above ground. And that's from a cost efficiency standpoint. Um, and we're hoping that Elon, who's, you know, um, we have a lot of folks from SpaceX. We have a very good relationship with them. He's working on trying to um, make more cost-efficient uh, tunnel diggers, and we hope that that happens. Um, that would be great for us. Um, so uh, yeah, so that that's really kind of the marketing. What is the value proposition? And it's, it's really nice to show CG videos and all that, and you know, do the do the tap dance. But I kind of want to show you what, what we've been working on, and I want to introduce you to DevLoop, which is the first and only uh, Hyperloop prototype that's working in the world. And uh, actually, when this ran for the first time, we called it our Kitty Hawk moment. So it's cool to show this to you. Going up to DevLoop for the first time was seeing just unbridled opportunity. You saw the desert completely bare, and you saw in your head, in your mind's eye, what we were going to put there. I felt really confident because I have a tremendous confidence in the people that I, I work with and the people on the team that, that I helped build. You've got teams from mechanical design, teams from computer engineering, and people who've worked on massive motor systems, massive rocket ships, and aerospace, aerodynamic engineering. This thing that started as a sketch and an idea, and then lived on this computer is now real, and it's welded and it's bolted, and you can put your hands on it. And then we actually assemble all the parts onto it and set it up to site, and you flip the power switch and it just comes to life. That's really the engineering dream, to get to see that whole process through. We broke all hyperloop speed records. And to think we did all this in 10 months, we proved to the whole world that we can build safely, quickly, efficiently, and prove the technology works. This is just the beginning. This company, like others in the Virgin family, has insatiable curiosity and the grit to get it done. I can't wait to see what we do next as a team. So that is DevLoop. That's an hour outside of Las Vegas. Um, it's a 500 meter test site. And uh, again, it's the first working prototype of a uh, Hyperloop system. So we accelerated um, for 300 meters and then decelerated for 200. So we didn't reach our 670 mile per hour speed, but it is statistically significant enough to understand that 
if we expand that out, the system ran safely and we'd be able to achieve that. And we'll talk about, again, safety and regulatory soon and, and what the future of DevLoop looks like and what the future of these t uh, testing and R&D uh, facilities look like as well. And if you don't believe me, um, we also, I just want a little shout out here if you guys could raise your hands, um, but uh, we have in the front row um, some uh, NCDOT interns that actually came to LA uh, and saw DevLoop as well. So give these guys a round of applause as well. They were amazing. Um, and one of the reasons why I'm here today. Uh, so uh, we hope that we can continue that relationship um, with North Carolina, and uh, if you want to ask them any questions afterwards, you guys would be cool with that? Okay, great. So you don't have to hear it from a marketing and comms guy, you can hear it from uh, some uh, North Carolinians. Um, so, Carolinians? Carolinians? Ooh, well, I just learned something new. All right, everybody, thank you so much. No, um, Carolinians, holy cow. Okay, I would not have guessed that, so, but now I know, thank you. Um, so let's talk about what's going on with projects. Um, so it's one thing to uh, have the, the tech going, Carolinians. I'm just gonna keep saying it so I don't, North Carolinians, yeah. Um, so anyway, um, okay, so we've got some great projects going on and I wanna tell you a little bit about how they actually started. Um, in 2016, when I came on board, we ran this thing called the Global Challenge. And the Global Challenge was about um, basically finding all around the world um, where the best routes are. Uh, and when we look at a route, we're looking at the population density of, of these places, the socioeconomic impact that it would have, um, what, uh, what the sentiment from a government standpoint looks like, not only from a federal um, and country level, but from a state and local level, especially with cities. Um, and so we just opened it up and we gave our specs and we gave what we could do and how fast we could go um, to just the world, basically, and said, you know, we're, we're going to ask you to do a feasibility study in the way that, that, that we do these internally um, so, so we don't limit our options. Um, because we got a lot of social media and things like that and emails that were like, you need to come here. You need to see what's going on. So we wanted to offer that up. We had 2,600 people um, uh, apply. We had 100... Uh, we had a hundred, I would say, reasonably good feasibility studies that were a hundred plus pages long. Um, so people took it really seriously. And then we had 35 around the world that were actually backed by some type of government or business where they could make it feasible. So um, some were alliances where it was uh, DOTs um, or their equivalents around the world. And then businesses that said, hey, you know, this actually seems like a really good opportunity for us as well to jump on board from a public-private partnership point of view. So everything that you see up on the screen, and we'll go through a couple of them, the ones in the US and India specifically, were part of that global challenge. Um, so it came from the communities that wanted to see something like this here, and that's really, really important to us. We have a huge uphill battle to get this up and running, and we need that support. We're not gonna come in and tell you what you need to be doing. We need to be doing this together as a partnership, which makes this a lot different than a value proposition like um, a car sharing service or something like that, which are very, very important. Um, but we can't just drop a hyperloop in your city um, and then say, you know, we'll, we'll work around it, right? That does not work for mass transportation. So we had to, we had to do something different. So we, we like that VC spirit and that entrepreneurial spirit, but we're also very respectful of, um, you know, the communities that we go into um, and understanding those impacts and working together. So uh, let's talk a little bit about some of the projects here. Uh, we're going to start with Texas. So Texas, again, was one of the global challenge um, participants. So um, we're actually working with the RTC in, in the north there, and uh, Texas is an interesting opportunity. Texas is super sprawled out, and our system, as it grows, actually gets better. So remember that direct-to-destination uh, opportunity that I was talking about? Let's say you start in Dallas, and we build this to Laredo. Um, so two people get on in Dallas, and I'm going to Laredo, and someone else is going to San Antonio, we're not getting on the same pods. We're going to direct, direct to that destination. So as that grows and expands, not only can we reach our max speeds, um, but uh, we're also point to point 
um, which saves a ton of time. Um, and that's, that's really our goal and objective. Um, and so one of the things that's great about Texas is that they're looking at a uh, EIS study to compare that, to compare us to high-speed rail and an environmental impact tier two study, um, which is uh, an important step um, from a feasibility standpoint to see whether or not we can actually make this project happen in a public-private partnership. So this is not a study that's commissioned privately. This is done um, from a public standpoint, and, and that's a that's a really it's a huge vote of confidence that people are taking and governments are taking our technology seriously after review and technical review. For Colorado, um, Colorado was actually one of the first people to move um, with Rodex and uh, the um, uh, Colorado DOT uh, in conjunction with AECOM, which I'm sure if you guys work in transportation, you guys are aware who AECOM is. Um, do we have any AECOM people in the room? Hey. All right, awesome, hey guys. Um, so, uh, AECOM is one of our, our partners there and is a partner with CDOT, um, and they're looking at a feasibility study that will connect the front range, which is not only important from a passenger standpoint, but also a cargo standpoint, um, where we can connect um, from Cheyenne to Pueblo uh, in about 30 minutes. I believe, yeah, so 30 minutes. That feasibility study will be made public in the next two quarters. I'm thinking probably March. Um, it could bleed into April, but um, that will be something that you can all, uh, dig into uh, when, when that uh, goes live. Missouri, so this is a really interesting one. Um, Missouri wants to connect St. Louis and uh, Kansas City. Um, St. Louis is a city that's uh, a little bit, I don't want to say crisis, but they, they have some issues when it comes to urban planning and they've sprawled out so much that they want to bring it back into the center of the city. So something like a Hyperloop system is very interesting to them to again change that mindset of when you get from Kansas City to St. Louis that you're using mass public transportation um, to get around um, and, and smart mobility there. Um, we've worked with Black and Beach um, which has been a great engineering partner for us and they actually took the brunt. So this is a, a privately um, uh, finance study and it actually uh, came out and you can look at the executive summary I believe in the next week or two and we're going to be pushing that out but I can give you some of the highlights there which I thought were really interesting between Kansas City and St. Louis right now it takes about three and a half to four hours um, by car on I-70 um, I-70 is a fun little fact is where the interstate highway started uh, in Missouri so uh, it's pretty old. So talking about, you know, we can't use a 1956 solution to solve our 21st century transportation problems, um, that's kind of what they're feeling right now, where they're treading water to, to fix that system, and it's really important, but they need something else to induce demand and keep people there, because they're also having brain drain where young people are, are leaving uh, and going other places. So we can connect Kansas City and St. Louis um, in less than half an hour from three and a half hours. Um, so huge time savings there and inducing demand between those two cities to expand those opportunities where people are not commuting um, right now. Also in Missouri, because in, a question that we got asked a lot is how much would a ticket cost? In that market specifically, because it would change based on you know, what the public-private partnership looks like, but we think that we could actually do a ticket cost in Missouri that would be around the uh, cost of a tank of gas. Uh, in Missouri. So it was like a $2 a gallon, so that would be about $30 one way. So a lot of people think that we would cost um, like a plane ticket, um, but that is definitely not the case. We want to induce demand and depending on what those uh, public subsidies look like, etc., you know, we could definitely envision a system where it's a monthly pass or something along those lines uh, to keep that going. And then in the Midwest, this is kind of mind-blowing to me, but there's no direct corridor between Chicago, Columbus, and Pittsburgh, um, which it's crazy. Um, and it's such an important part of our country. And um, Warpsy, uh, which is based in Columbus, and also was recognized as uh, the top smart city um, a couple of years ago, um, is leading the charge on this. And they want to look at Hyperloop technology for a couple of different reasons. Um, not only for the route itself, um, but there's a lot of uh, manufacturing 
prowess in, in that part of the world, um, steel manufacturers, etc. So we're not only looking for the software uh, jobs, etc., but we're also looking for welders and to hire those those people as well. And so the job creation in that market, if the Midwest was one of the first ones to go um, and to create some type of R and D center, would would be. Um, a huge opportunity for them. So they're looking, they're actually working with AECOM as well on an EIS study, um, tier one, to look at um, hyperloop technology specifically and then also compare it to high speed rail. And then finally, a little bit um, farther away from home, but if I'm being quite honest, and I, I really want to see something happen in the United States sooner rather than later, but um, I've spent a lot of time and I've lived in India at this point um, for this job, and uh, this is something that gets me out of bed in the morning when things are really tough at Hyperloop, um, is this project. Um, we have a, a framework to build agreement with the state of Maharashtra, which is very different than an MOU, a feasibility study, etc. They've bought in and they need right now some type of new form of transportation to be able to move the millions and millions of people um, that commute between Mumbai and Pune uh, to create those job opportunities and just decongest. Um, there are, I don't even know where to start with this, but there's so many stats that I want to tell you about. One of them is that there are 110,000 vehicles that move between those two cities every single day. Um, if we put a Hyperloop system in between Mumbai and Pune, we would be able to, um, I think, take about 126 million trips. Uh, and when you think about that, it's, it's pretty mind-blowing um, how much that's needed. We would take about 110,000 tons of pollution out of the air every single year. And then over the next 30 years, um, McKinsey has said that we would bring in about 55 billion in socioeconomic benefits into that region in the country. And over the next 70, we would employ about one, um, oh gosh, I think it's 990,000 people, uh, which is pretty incredible. So this is an extreme socioeconomic case. Um, this is a project that from a public-private partnership perspective could actually be privately funded completely if the government is able to give us the land to do it. So um, I think that this will probably be one of the first mover projects. And um, when we talk about safety and regulatory, we're looking from a global perspective. Um, so uh, we can dig into that a little bit more if you have questions about it. But uh, this is a project that's on the horizon in the next decade, not decades. Um, we're hoping to have this project up and running hopefully by 2028. So, uh, at that, I will say thank you so much for your time uh, today. I'm more than happy to answer any questions, answer any tough questions that you have. Don't be, don't be shy. So, thank you so much for having me, and uh, hopefully it was worth your time. Thank you. Try to put a microphone to the table so you can sit down. I'm pretty loud. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm gonna sit down. Uh, <laughs> talk to these um, Carolinas. Yeah, I'm just joking, Carolinas. Um, so, just the first question. Um, and I'm not to do this because you don't need this microphone. Sure. Well, I will reach. So. Um, how do you see Hyperloop change in the way we do mobility in the United States? And realistically, given what you just said, when could that be the case? Sure, so I think there needs to be a, a, a change in mindset about how we think about mass public transportation. Um, you, look at, like, it's, you look at a city like Los Angeles, which is, uh, we sit in traffic going you know, a couple miles and it's you know, an hour, um, why? Why are we doing that to ourselves? Like, what, what kind of mental state have we been like programmed that like the bus is not a viable option? Um, and that's kind of crazy. And I think that it's a little bit twofold. Um, we need to be able to figure out a solution, 21st century solution, and not a 1956 interstate highway solution. Um, and so I, I think for me, in the United States, I think the first thing that we need to do is um, get 
states, cities, and the federal government on board, understanding where we fall within the regulatory system, and then understanding what kind of help um, we're going to be provided in the same way that, well, hopefully not in the same way that, that trains and planes have, have been provided that help because we, we have a very strong socioeconomic case, but we at least want to have the opportunity to be open to be getting some of that, that, that funding opportunity as well. Well, that's a great segue. Before I say that, I should tell you that in the room, Ryan, you actually have people from our board, including <coughs> our um, board vice chair, Nina, here on the front row. Uh, Secretary is here for minutes going to accept out, but you have folks from our rail division, you have folks from our DMV uh, division, you have folks from highways, freight. Um, so the question is, how can um, governments at all levels be supportive of what you're doing? Other than just regulatory, because I'll come back to that in a second. And other than just money. Sure. I think it's I think it's understanding the ecosystem. So where we've we where we've had success is that um, politicians understand what we're trying to provide and you know have come out to our site, things of that nature, so that they have a better understanding of, of the socioeconomic benefits of something like this. Also understanding from an ecosystem perspective, since it's a public-private partnership, what private partners will will work with us on these things. So I mentioned AECOM as a partner. Black and Veatch is situated in Missouri. The University of Missouri system has stepped up to the plate to form this Hyperloop coalition where they're looking to raise private funds um, for the project itself so that the burden is not completely on the government. And the only reason that we can do that is because the socioeconomic case works. Um, and uh, you know, also working with other modes of transportation to understand how we can integrate together um, and use those resources. Um, eminent domain is a huge issue and, and costs a ton of money. So understanding where we can fit in to the structures that already exist is very, very important to us. Speaking of that, because we have our highways folks and my friends from uh, North Carolina Railroad, how do you convince them that you can coexist in the right of way with them? I'm sure you've had this question in other places. Sure. So, for, well, I, I, it's different in every place, right? So, you have a situation in a place like Missouri where there's a sense amongst the people that investing in infrastructure is, is a tax suck. Uh, on people, and depending on where you are, I think one of the interesting things about some of the, yeah, and yeah, it depends on where you are. In California, you know, it might be a little bit different than in a place like Missouri. But you'll notice on that sheet, you know, this is a purple issue, um, which I think is really interesting, and that's kind of the the way that we we move through. You know, um, we have some Republican states, we have some Democrat states, etc. But infrastructure is for everybody, um, and so you know, when it comes to if we can show that we induce demand, we not only induce demand for ourselves, but we induce demand for other mass public transportation systems. And if we can be that catalyst and that tipping point for people understanding that mass transportation isn't just a secondary when times are tough and the economy's rough, that maybe I, maybe I shouldn't be taking my car into the center of the city. Maybe I should be dropping my car off uh, at a train station. Um, and taking the train in, or taking the bus, or using an Uber, or a Lime, or something along those lines. Um, and that's, that's a, a mental shift that we're hoping, with Hyperloop as the backbone, that, that we can you know, beef up everybody else's uh, uh, volumes. So let's talk about money for a minute. Yeah. So um, you, you, um, you, you spoke generally uh, a while ago, and when one of the interns asked that question a while ago, they said millions. Yeah. So let's narrow down the per mile and the cost. Um, as much as we can, at least get this crowd to understand uh, how would you decide how it, what it costs and, and how quickly can we get it to a point where the general public can actually use it as an alternative mode to, to move around? Sure, so um, I will use, let's see. Okay, so taking a step back, um, when we did the Missouri Feasibility Study, and for anyone that's interested in the room, we can send you that information, I'll send it to you and a couple other folks, um, but we, we want to compare apples to apples because doing a route in North Carolina versus doing um, a route in Missouri versus doing a route between Los Angeles and San Francisco is a very, very different from a, a per mile cost standpoint. What we do know when we do measure apples to apples is that our linear infrastructure cost um, is about 60% of high-speed rail. 
Um, and that's not including the portals or the pods that are necessary, and I don't calculate that in because it depends on what the demand looks like for how many pods that we need, uh, et cetera. Um, when it comes to the per mile cost, things like that, it would be in the millions of dollars, but as most of you guys know in transportation infrastructure, um, mass infrastructure you know, for, uh, for a route, for an interstate highway, is millions of dollars. Um, and in the case of the Mumbai to Pune route, um, it's going to be close to a billion dollars um, or, or more. So um, there, there also has to be a level setting there about, you know, this is not going to cost nothing. What was really important to us is to understand this is the investment in and this is what you get back out. Um, and we're not having those conversations. Instead, the conversations are about this is a tax suck on me and I'm not getting anything out of it because those, those benefits need to be described because people feel like we're treading water. When it comes to the first time that you can ride a Hyperloop system, um, I think the first one will probably be in India, um, unless something changes um, massively in, in the US, which, hey, you never know. Um, but we are a US-based company. We want to see R&D here. We want to see jobs here. Um, and I know that the feasibility studies that we just put up there and the governments that um, are doing them really want to see something happen. I don't think that you'll see anything before in the United States before 2028. Um, but again, when you can kind of compare and contrasting your Kitty Hawk moment to your commercial jet, we are shrinking that opportunity uh, <laughs> exponentially from, from that Kitty Hawk moment to commercialization. So, yeah, and cost for consumer. So we gave. Yeah, it's got to be competitive. It's got to be something that's competitive with everyday tra travel. It can't be. It can't be the same ticket cost as a as an airplane. That would make sense from an economic standpoint. And uh, yeah. So you need to fall between Amtrak and the airline. I mean, I don't know how many of you guys have bought a ticket between Boston and New York with Amtrak, but that is the cost of an airplane ticket. So we can't do that either. Um, that's just that's not going to work for us. Okay, so I have a few more questions, but I'll go to the audience for just one or two. And because we don't have a mic to roam, you're going to have to stand up and talk really loud so we can hear you. So who has the first question? Scott, stand up. What you got? So two questions. Number one, what's your cost range per mile? You said 60% of high-speed rail. Question number one. Number two would be how much right-of-way do you need? So the question is per mile cost and projected right of way. I mean, predict, yeah, projected right of way needs. Sure. So, got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That was a that was a pointed question. The, um, so, what I would actually suggest, if if you don't mind, I'm more than happy to give the feasibility study to you guys to look at all those different numbers. We would have to do, in order to make it specific to this area, we'd have to do a feasibility study, as I'm sure, sure you're aware of working in, in rail. Um, I believe that the Missouri one was about 33 million per mile. Yeah, yeah. So, um, but let me, let me double check on that for you and I can get you those numbers. Yeah, so the right of way, oh, I'm going to mess this up. Um, I don't want to give you a number on that. Let me, let me give you the feasibility study for that. So I don't want to misspeak and then you walk away with wrong information. So, but in Missouri, I know that we're using the right of way for the interstate highway for I-70. Down the middle, yeah. Down the middle, so whatever that typical space is, probably a couple of, um, couple of lines. Anybody else with a question? So I had a question over here. Yeah, what you got there? Speak um, up for me. Sure. Uh, good afternoon, Nate. I'm Magdalena at CTOT. Uh, I'd be interested in, you see Hyperloop discussed as connecting urban centers to urban centers. Uh, I think North Carolina has an interesting challenge between the rural and urban, di urban divide. Do you see this as a possible tool to say you can work in Raleigh, you can yeah. live on the coast, yeah, n no doubt. So if you look at, the, that's a huge concern specifically for Missouri. So in uh, Columbia, which is in between uh, St. Louis and Kansas City, you have the University of Missouri, but you also have a lot of rural areas, farming areas, etc. 
And so um, we didn't really talk about the cargo case, but actually our main investor is DP World, which owns ports all around the world. And they're actually, even though Virgin's name is on the door, DP World is really you know, one of our largest investor and is our chairman, um, uh, or as the chairman seat right now. So what our value proposition there for farmers or rural areas is that it could be um, the speed of flight, but at like the cost of trucking. So there could be good opportunity depending on what the need is to be able to ship perishable goods and things like that for, for farming environments. Um, but again, for people that would rather live in rural areas or have a little bit more space, et cetera, depending, it, there needs to be an economic case for it, um, but you could put in a stop very easily. So in, in the case of Columbia, there's something interesting there because the university is there um, and could could facilitate an R&D facility, um, and that makes sense in and of itself, but it could also pull in some of those rural areas um, where they could get to either city in 15 minutes. Let me switch gears real quick while I'm looking for another hand, which I don't see right now. Safety-wise, um, trying to get people to understand uh, why it's okay to travel at 600 miles an hour. I know you compared it to airplanes, but talk to us about what that looks like. I mean, what does it look like from a safety standpoint of being closer to the ground and just all those things? How does that work? Yeah, so this is something that I'm thinking about a lot as of late, especially as the the India project is on a roll and uh, this is a real this is the real deal now. So we need to figure out from a global safety and regulatory standpoint, which go hand in hand, the two are different um, in the way that we Think about them, but our product itself um, has a few few new issues. But I would say about two thirds of our tech um, could actually be regulated either under um, the FRA or the FAA. Um, so because we create our own sky inside the tube, um, that would look more like FAA. But since we are on the ground and, and are using a feasibility. Uh, or an EIS study that's, that seems more like a rail. Um, the other part of this, though, that's different is the autonomous system. So we want pods leaving within seconds of one another. There's no conductor on the train um, <laughs> or on the pod. Uh, so that will have to be regulated. What makes us different, because we actually we, we sat on um, a, a panel for um, science, commerce, and transportation in the Senate um, and testified there. Um, and I was with um, a good friend of mine, Tina Quigley, who, who runs innovation in, in Las Vegas, and she um, is working with autonomous vehicles. And they have, because we're a closed system, we don't have some of the same safety concerns um, as, as open air autonomous systems, right? So if some, no one's gonna be in the tube, or there's no cow crossing, or there's no vehicle crossing, and that's one of the main safety concerns when it comes to to rail, so inherently our system um, is trying to avoid as much human error as possible. We're actually trying to close the system um, as much as we can, um, which helps, you know, um, uh, re you know, get rid of some of those safety concerns. When it comes to consumer travel, um, the G-force would be about 0.2 Gs, um, so it would be, you know, less than takeoff of a plane um, or or around the same when you're propelled out, and then it's a it's a glide. From there, so the G-force there will not will not be uh, too bad uh, for for you if you can handle take off in a plane, and it'll actually be less turbulent as well. So let's put our interns on the spot real quick. Um, so uh, Morgan, Erica, could you stand for me? These are two of the four that we sent out. Can we turn around so they can see. Uh, two of the four that we sent out from our HBCU internship program last summer that actually had a chance to go out and see everything you just saw in the video. They went to LA and sat with the staff to understand how it's marketed, how they're dealing with the human uh, impact uh, factors, and then they got to go uh, to, um, to Nevada and they actually got to see the prototype that you just saw. So um, I'm gonna put one of you on the spot. So why don't we go with Morgan here, because so you're okay. Uh, so Morgan, come tell us uh, this one of the things that you took away from it that would be important for this crowd, especially if North Carolina ever wanted to have uh, a hyperloop in, uh, in our state. Um, personally, my, my main uh, focus was in regards to my peers and myself. 
So I was looking at it at, from the standpoint of how is this going to benefit me and my peers. So I'm a, I'm a college student. I go to North Carolina a &T. So having a hyperloop in Greensboro, I know there's a lot of commuters coming from all areas of the United States. So I feel like it will be a way that we could travel from home and back and possibly not even have to live on campus. Um, and it will be a more um, economic option as opposed to flying um, as well and get from home and on campus quickly. What were your thoughts when you went out there? Um, it's basically opened up opportunities for people um, at a standpoint from like out of, out of college, um, having the ability to live somewhere and then work somewhere else is opening opportunities for people in other like rural areas. You can travel and go to the city and work there if you want to still live in whatever area that you currently live in. So. And again, the goal is to make sure that we're exposing, um, exposing all of our students that come to work for us to see um, not just kind of where transportation is, but where it's going. So got a question right up front and then I saw so Susan and Nina will in, okay, I'm married. So I got three. Sean, I'm gonna wrap up. All right, Nina, watch. Nina first. Sure, um, that's a great question. And it's something that we're working from a federal level. So I, I think from, to, long story short on your question, I think being able to work with the, the federal government as well to say, hey, we have this opportunity. Um, how, are we, how are we categorizing and positioning these new, new digitized smart mobility options, right? So you're completely right. It's not just a Hyperloop issue. It's a how do we, and when we were sitting on the, that, that board um, testifying before the Senate, the, uh, the thing that four of us had in common were that we were smart mobility options and they didn't know where to put us. Um, because we are in a plane, we are in a train, right? Or in the case of like an Uber or a Bird or something along those lines, you're you're an iteration on a product that already exists. So um, being able to to push and talk to you know a, a it needs to basically come from like a federal regulatory level is, is what our 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 thought is. Um, but having that support um, has shown to bear fruit. Um, for uh, the folks that we're working with on some of these feasibility projects that have talked um, to you know heads at the DOT that said hey are you guys looking at this and and um, from a financing standpoint you know getting that aid um, to potentially look into feasibility studies and just be treated in a similar way um, or be given a fair shot to be able to get some of those those grants and, and funding grants as well which is helpful for, for the local folks too. Once we show that it's feasible and that this is an economically viable thing. Um, I want to drill down even further though, and maybe it's a question you might have been alluding to, but I think it's something of interest. Um, we're not only looking at a project certification, but we're looking at product certification as well to go towards operational and commercial certification. So we're kind of doing this at the same it, it, at the same time, so you know, while we're we have independent assessors from an engineering standpoint that will look at subsystems of our tech, um, we'll also be looking at the route um, and building in India as an example. Our hope is that we can build a test site um, out there that's about 11 kilometers long, um, where we'll be able to test components of our our product. Um, where we can have regulators from the United States, as well as India, as well as the European Union, DG Move, et cetera, come out in the same way that you know, regulators will come out to see the Japanese um, bullet train, uh, as an example. So it doesn't have to be here in the United States, and we're, we're working on that uh, with the FRA right now, although obviously we would love to have a, a test and development site here in the US uh, as well. Been trying to talk them into to it being in North Carolina, by the way. So remember the hashtag NC Transportation Summit. And let's talk about how we wanted to be in North Carolina. Susan? So uh, it's, it seems to me that from a business proposition, um, uh, one offs, and I don't mean that don't mean that they have a negative kind of negative but these are all one offs you're talking about. Right. Advantage of the economies of scale that you would have if you were talking about more 
Right. When you talk about more of a system, uh, again, I, I don't want to be um, uh, condescending, no. but um, uh, at your age, you never knew the world without an interstate. So right. uh, that was high tech at the time. Yes. Coast to coast without a stoplight. You know, yeah. it preceded me to a point. Yeah. In any case, um, <laughs> yeah. my, my point is that uh, maybe your regulatory um, focus might be in terms of building in the kinds of standards or the kinds of relationships, yeah. institutional or whatever, because the interstate, yeah, it's aging. And yeah. Showing it's age. It needs to be modernized. Absolutely. And maybe in the modernizing, we be working. Yeah, I, I mean, and, and to your point, we need, we need every, first of all, as you know, and everybody in this room knows, there's such a huge man, demand for investment in infrastructure. And the United States, historically, you know, with an interstate highway system, has led in that regard, and we haven't necessarily been leading. Um, if you look and compare and contrast, like, you know, we don't have a high speed rail system here in the United States. It's just, officially, we just don't. Right, um, you have to hit a certain mile per hour to do that, um, and and instead we've been treading water. And so, what are ways that we can look at public-private partnership opportunities? Where yes, if we're using the medium, how do we how do we work with um, the the highway system to not only upgrade a hyperloop system but also help the highways? And what kind of smart technology can we use to to benefit both? And you know, we're talking with we're talking with energy companies to do the same thing. Like, what if you use our eminent domain uh, for that, and then you can help regulate that system? You know, how can we how can we use this opportunity? And again, talking by William here, but like, how can we use this tipping point opportunity to help everyone along the path? Because we not only need to build new tech, but we also need to invest in our older technology, which is a foundation. And a transportation foundation. This is not a hyperloop is going to solve all your problems. Um, but to your point about the one-off projects, um, we've taken the approach that we can't boil the ocean anymore. So we've we went out there. We asked people like, you know, where should we go? Um, we've been able to kind of, you know, filter that down into certain areas where we think that there there are potential. There's definitely potentially more uh, as well. But we have such large hurdles to overcome that we want to make sure that we focus on the projects that we can get done. We need one project done. And then at that point, once we show and we certify and we regulate, then I think at that point it's talking about connecting the United States in a matter of five hours, which is what we could potentially do from coast to coast. Um, so no question here? All right, so uh, and maybe what we should be doing is thinking about it in mega regions and not the whole United States, because then it would make a lot more sense. Um, so we're out of time, and I want to get you guys out of here. So uh, one last question for you, Ryan. What's next for Hyperloop? Uh, what's next? I mean, what, what, do, what, what happens next? So in the United States, you're going to see more feasibility studies coming out from Colorado, Texas, and Ohio uh, this year in 2019. Um, we're also hoping to break ground in India by the end of 2019. So that's what's next on the horizon right now, but we definitely still want to continue the conversation in the United States. Um, we want to drill down into the regulatory um, framework and for you transportation folks, uh, feel free to follow along. But um, I think that you'll see in 2019, it's all about commercialization um, versus you know showing the tech at Dev Loop, things like that. So. so I've been talking to them since last year, since we started out, it's about where their R&D needs will be. And because we have such strong universities, whether or not North Carolina would make sense. And what Ryan made sense to, uh, what it said to me, and it made sense is that they'll be looking for R&D opportunities where they have real opportunities to put in a system. So uh, with that, I mean, it starts by talking about feasibility studies. So maybe we need to do a North Carolina feasibility study, uh, real division, looking at you, Jason, um, just to kind of see, uh, and just to scare Jeff Man to death. Maybe we'll look at it not from Durham to um, Durham to Chapel Hill, we'll do from Chapel Hill to Raleigh. <laughs> so anyway, let's uh, join me in thanking Ryan for coming from California.